Hi, welcome back to Philosophy 101, Morals in Society. I am Chris Ann Moore. So last week we talked about the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, and the moral theory that was developed by Immanuel Kant. Today we're going to move into the 19th century and the moral theory that uh, dominated the Western world after the 19th century, which is utilitarianism. But before we go forward to utilitarianism, program 21, I want to look back at some of the uh, ideas that we went over in the last episode. As we saw during the Enlightenment, the age of reason that had followed the Renaissance, the Reformation, the scientific revolution, once again people were looking to philosophy to answer that question, how ought I live? However, philosophical epistemology was problematic. What theory of knowledge could be used to answer these questions? And we saw that both methods that were developed were problematic. Rationalism, which proposed that universal ideas could be gained by applying logic to a priori truths, presented the problem of proving the existence of a priori, a priori truths rather than just declaring them. Empiricism, of course, which claim that all knowledge comes from experience, leaves us in the egocentric predicament. And so, philosophy was deeply flawed as a way of knowing. At least that was obvious to many. And then, Immanuel Kant solved that problem. Or at least he provided a brilliant, sound argument that moved philosophy forward. Because what Immanuel Kant did is he was able to provide a brilliant argument for the existence of a priori ideas. In fact, Immanuel Kant quite persuasively showed us that a priori ideas are the way the mind structures thought and experience. And in fact, are universal ideas because every human mind structures thought and experience in the same way. We structure our thoughts around an eye, around the assumptions of three-dimensional space and forward-moving time. And indeed, most important for our purposes, Morality is a fundamental component of rationality existence and existent in all normal human beings. And so from this argument that established the existence of a priori ideas, Immanuel Kant developed what was a powerful, persuasive, and incredibly influential moral theory. That universal morality could be universally derived by applying logic to the a priori idea of morality. And from this, he developed a brilliant method for doing just that. Every moral act should be universalizable. In other words, if one imagined that that act created a universal moral law, a law of nature that everyone had to follow, could that law be followed? Would it be possible? Would it be logical for everyone to act that way? This is, of course, the categorical imperative. Furthermore, Kant said you had to ask yourself, would you be willing to treat, be treated the way your law treats others? And this is simply logic. If you're going to will a universal law, you have to be willing to be subject to that law. So Kant is saying, let's use pure logic. Is the action universalizable? Because since morality is a component of rationality universal in all human beings, no human being can make themselves special. No human being can say, this is right for me to do, but wrong for you. Therefore, what is rationally moral? Everyone can do. And you must be able to be subject to the laws which you will. Another formulation of the categorical imperative, which Kant called the practical imperative, is always act so as to treat yourself and others as an end and never simply as a means. And this simply means that you can't use people. The people are rational beings deserving of respect and dignity. They are capable of determining their own purposes, of deciding upon their own ends, and therefore you cannot manipulate and deceive them into a tool for accomplishing your ends. Again, this seems like simple common sense. Don't use people. And so as we began to employ this method to different moral dilemmas and ethical controversies, we saw that it persuaded, it provided us with a very powerful method. 
However, as we began to speak at the end of the last episode, Kant's method, Kant's theory, like all moral theories, is flawed. As we've talked about again and again in this show, if there were a moral theory that was, had no flaws, if human beings had discovered the ultimate moral theory with no, thought, no flaws, excuse me, we wouldn't need to have a college class in ethics. But then again, we would all have to have the same moral determinations. There would be no freedom in moral determinations. There would be no individual interpretation as well. So that has a plus side and a minus side. So as we ended the last episode, we were looking at some of those flaws in Kant's moral theory. The first flaw is, how does one make this universal rule? It's as difficult as we saw. Is the rule as general as possible? Or do you include specifics in the rule? And if so, what specifics do you include? And the example we used was that of homosexuality. Obviously, if you universalize homosexuality thus, everyone must be homosexual. The rule is self-defeating. It fails. Because if we create a universal natural law that everyone must be homosexual, procreation becomes threatened. And of course, the argument that there are reproductive technologies to take care of that is insufficient because these are available to the only a very few, are extremely expensive, and don't always work. So everyone must be homosexual fails as a universal rule. However, what if we add specifics to that rule? Everyone who is by nature homosexual should be homosexual. Now, there is nothing about that rule that fails. It is perfectly able to be carried out universally. So then it passes. So this is the difficulty, and you will find this difficulty as you start working on cases. You are going to have to decide what specifics of any particular moral dilemma or ethical controversy should be included in the rule that you're creating. Now Kant was very general and absolute, which is also considered by some to be a problem in his method. As we were talking about, Kant believed that no one should lie. Because the universal rule, everyone must lie, is utterly self-defeating. Because the entire point of a lie is to deceive. And a universal rule is public. Therefore, a deceit that is known about is no deceit at all. It's illogical and fails. By that rule, Kant said himself that if you believe that by lying you would save a human being from a murderer, you, should, you still should not lie. If someone had run into your house, escaping from a murderer and hid in your house, and the murderer came to the door and said, is so and so here, you were obligated to tell the truth. Yes, they just ran in. Now most people find that very difficult to accept. It doesn't seem to make sense. Now Kant argues that once you have told the truth, the other person may have escaped. They still may get away. Your obligation is simply to tell the truth. What happens after that is not your responsibility. However, if you lie and say the person is not here, the murderer goes around the alley and the person is actually leaving your home, then you are responsible for what happens. This seems odd at best. You are not responsible if you tell the truth. But you are responsible if you lie. A lot of philosophers have had, had have, excuse me, have had a big problem with this. Now, there are other problems with Kantian ethics, as you might realize. One of them is Kant's entire moral theory is based on rationality. As a matter of fact, he locates human value in human rationality. This is very persuasive at first, but if we examine it more closely, it is problematic. Because all human beings are not equally rational. Does that mean that we are not equally valuable? If rationality is what makes me valuable as a human being, or makes you valuable as a human being, an infant is not rational. Does that mean that an infant is not equally valuable? Or the older person with, Down, with Alzheimer's? Or the person with Down syndrome? Are human beings that are not capable of rationality not equally valuable? This is problematic. 
it is problematic because there are animals that are more rational than certain human beings. Infants, for instance. So people have taken an exception to Kant's emphasis on human rationality and human reason. People have also objected to the fact that Kant has attempted to remove feelings from ethics. In fact, Kant said ethics cannot be based on feeling because feeling is notoriously unstable. What I love one day, I may hate the next. What inspires me at one moment bores me in the next moment. So Kant truly believed that morality, which had to be universal and eternal and un unchanging over time, could not be based on feelings. And therefore, the person who sends money to charity because they have been moved by the story of someone suffering is somehow less moral than the person who does it simply because it is a duty. The person who does something which they believe is right for no other reason than because it is right is somehow less moral than the person who is moved by compassion, by empathy, by sympathy, by care. And yet, for many people, it is these very feelings of compassion and empathy and sympathy and care that mark the truly moral human being. So, although Kant's argument is persuasive, it is incomplete in somehow in eliminating feelings from moral consideration. And Kant also removes consideration of consequences from deciding whether an action is moral or not. This also seems counterintuitive. Many people believe that it is the consequences of an action that determine that action's morality, not some rational, logical, deductive reasoning. And finally, probably uh, most interesting in terms of the way we've been discussing morality in this course, Kant has divorced moral considerations from considerations of self-interest. In fact, Kant goes so far as to say, if an action is taken in one's own self-interest, it is not a moral act. If I save someone who's drowning because I believe it'll get me into heaven, it's not a moral act, but a practical act. If I am honest because I believe that that will surround me with friends or make me a better person in society, that's not a moral act. If one is honest simply because honesty is good, one is moral. But this leaves many cold and is actually contrary to the very title of this book that we're using, The Pursuit of Happiness. Because in essence, the very heart of morality is the idea that being good, by being good, I am not only doing good for myself, I am doing good for others. Morality is that place where the good for oneself meet the good for another. Now, self-interest is not selfishness, as we, as we have discussed again and again. And therefore, most moral theorists place the justification for morality, the reason to be moral, in that it provides for human fulfillment, or that it brings human happiness, or that it makes life better for all in some way. This is, in essence, the heart of morality. And by divorcing morality from self-interest, in a sense, Kant cuts out that heart and leaves people cold. You'll have to, of course, decide for yourself what you think about that. But for all its flaws, Kant's moral theory has been extremely influential because it is extraordinarily persuasive. And most of us would agree that most of the time, the morality of an action can be judged by the fact whether you'd be willing to have everyone else act that way. That most moral acts can be judged by the fact, is it reversible? Would I be willing to be treated that way? And most of us would agree that you should not use people. And so Kant has captured in logical form what many of us would consider common sense morality. And perhaps more importantly, or actually certainly more importantly, Kant developed a sound argument for the establishment of a priori ideas and, therefore, and thereby established a base for philosophical reasoning. 
not only philosophical reasoning, but Kant's insights transform science. They transform psychology. They transform sociology. In fact, Kant's insights have had an enormous impact. And Kant is probably the premier philosophical figure of the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment, the 17th and 18th century. Because of these advancements in philosophy and corresponding advancements in science, the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment were extraordinarily optimistic times. People really believed that between science and reason, that all human problems would be solved, that science would find the cure to all diseases, that science would actually help us figure out how to feed the starving, and no one would ever starve again, that reason would help us determine the social and political systems that would provide for human fulfillment and prevent human suffering. It, there was this look towards the future as if it could only be conquered, as if it could only be better, as if human advancement was assured. Well, today we're going to start looking at the 19th century. And unfortunately, the 19th century belied the great optimism of the 17th and 18th centuries. Advancements had been made, yes. Democracies had been instituted. The concept that human beings deserved equal rights had been put forward in the documents of countries. But most of those advancements that the great optimists looked forward to did not occur. As, in fact, as a matter of fact, the 19th century saw suffering on a scale that was before unimaginable. It was vast suffering of millions of people. And the vast suffering of millions of people seemed to reveal the inadequacies, in some ways, of enlightenment, of enlightenment thinking. And the next moral theory that we look at, utilitarianism, was actually developed as a response to those failures, as a response, indeed, to that suffering. Let me ask you a question. Let's, before we begin looking at our next moral theory, I want you to consider uh, ethical controversy. Should prostitution be legalized? Take a few moments and think about that question. Should prostitution be legalized, let's say, in the United States of America? Well, I have heard many arguments before and against the legalization of prostitution. Some of those who argue against the legalization of prostitution say that it will increase sexually transmitted diseases, that it will promote prostitution and therefore promote the crime and drug use that is associated with that lifestyle. They argue that the legalization of prostitution will undermine family values and it will destroy those neighborhoods in which legal brothels are allowed. Those are some of the arguments that people put forward against the legalization of prostitution. There are others, however, that argue that the legalization of prostitution would allow for regulation of prostitution. These people argue that actually the legalization of prostitution will cause a decrease in sexually transmitted diseases because of regulation. That the crime and drug use that accompanies this lifestyle would be decreased because of regulation. That the neighborhoods in which, in which prostitution is now practiced illegally would be protected by laws which govern prostitution and that everyone would benefit from the tax benefits, the tax revenues that come from the legalization of prostitution. Now, it should be apparent that both of these arguments need a lot more evidence. They both make claims. On each side, there would be a need to provide evidence to back up either of those claims. For now, though, what interests me about both these arguments that I have heard again and again is every single one of these arguments look to the consequences of legalizing prostitution in order to determine the morality of legalizing prostitution. In matter of fact, I am sure Many of you took some consideration of legalizing the constants, the, pardon me, took some consideration 
of the consequences of legalizing prostitution into your analysis of the argument. We think that way, actually. It's almost natural for us to begin calculating consequences. However, that is because moral thinking dependent on consequences became a hugely influential moral theory in the 19th century. Before that, it was not true. Before that, moral theories did not look to the consequences of actions in order to determine the morality of actions. Kant went so far as to make every effort to eliminate consideration of consequences. If you think about this, then it'll be clear. Let's look at some of the moral theories we've looked at before. Natural law theory. According to natural law theory, should one legalize prostitution? No, of course not. Prostitution is a violation of the fundamental value of procreation, which is not excused by forfeiture or double effect, and thus immoral by natural law theory. Natural law theory has no need to just look at consequences to determine morality. Kantian ethics. Should one legalize prostitution according to Kantian ethics? Well, is prostitution universalizable? Can we make a universal law that everyone must prostitute themselves? That's self-defeating. If everyone's paying everyone, nobody's making money off of prostitution. But further than that, it should be very clear that prostitution is using oneself and others as simply a means, and thus completely immoral by Kantian ethics. As a matter of fact, Kant himself said so in his lecture on ethics, basically. One would be using another as a means. It's immoral. Most divine command theories would disagree with the legalization of prostitution. And of course, Buddhist ethics it is wrong use of sexuality. Each of these theories would condemn the legalization of prostitution, but what is important to realize is not a single one of them would look to the consequences. Each of these theories are non-consequentialist. That is, these theories do not examine consequences in order to determine the morality of the action. Instead, they look to some moral law and see if the action conforms to the moral law. Now, in natural law theory, there is some small consideration of consequences. As you remember, the fourth question of double effect, the, the, the theory of proportionality asks if the good outweighs the bad, but this is only the fourth question of double effect. It is the very last step in the theory, and most would never even get there. So it is basically a non-consequentialist theory. So let's look that over. Non-consequentialist moral theories do not take the consequences of an action into account when judging the morality of an action. Some examples of non-consequentialist theory. Well, most of the theories we've looked at. Divine common theory, non-consequentialist. Intuitionism, non-consequentialist. One does not examine the consequences of an action. One goes within and hears that inner voice. Natural law theory, Kant's ethics. Each of these are non-consequentialist. And yet, we think, to a great extent, consequentially. We think about the consequences determine morality. Today, we're going to look at two consequential. Actually, over the next two programs, we're going to look at two consequentialist moral theories. Now, consequentialist moral theories determine the morality of an action by its consequences. And the two Consequentialist moral theories we're going to look at are act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. So, you should see now we have two categories of ethical theory. There are objective moral theories, those moral theories that believe that morality is universal and objective. And there are relative moral theories moral theories that propose that morality is a creation of human beings. It is made by individuals and cultures or by those in power. Now, of the objective moral theories, there are two categories of objective moral theory that we now have. There are non-consequentialist moral theories, 
divine command theory, natural law theory, intuitionism, Kantian ethics, non-consequentialist. And today we're going to look at another subcategory, which is the consequentialist moral theories. Now, as I said before, the consequentialist moral theories were really developed in response to the conditions of the 19th century. Really in response to the suffering of millions of people in the 19th century. So I want to look first at some of those conditions that arose in the 19th century which impelled this new kind of morality. Before 1700, over 90% of European economy was based in agriculture. By 1850, over 50% of that economy was industrial based. At the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution happened. And indeed, it revolutionized life for millions and millions of people. You see, the scientific developments of the scientific revolution and the age of reason and the enlightenment had led to the development of large-scale machinery. Large-scale machinery led to the creation of factories. Goods that had been produced in cottage industries at home or in small shops could now be manufactured quicker, cheaper, and often of better quality. Well, these large machines needed people to run them, and they needed massive amounts of coal to supply energy to run them. And there was suddenly a demand in the factory towns and the manufacturing for thousands of workers to supply labor. At the same time, agriculture was failing. Now, in this course, we cannot possibly cover all the reasons that agriculture was failing. Well, suffice to say that in some cases it was the weather, famine. In other cases, Agriculture was manipulated to fail for political gain and for monetary gain on the part of those in power. But either way, what had happened was that people who had for generations supported their families by working the land and selling their produce lost that family inheritance. For others, although they were able to just hold on to their farm, they could no longer support their families or their children from the produce of the farm. People in the tens of thousands moved into cities to get jobs in these new factories. Well, this was a time of unregulated capitalism, what we call laissez-faire or hands-off capitalism. In other words, there were no laws that regulated what an owner could do with his property or with his business. An owner could pay whatever he liked, could charge whatever he liked, and he could demand that his workers work under the conditions that he chose. And I use the word he on purpose here because, of course, the vast majority of the owners were male. Well, when thousands of people are coming in to a town, there are only so many jobs. What does the owner have to pay under those circumstances? As little as he chooses. And now, the development of machinery had made it so that strength was not necessary for many of these jobs. And so women and children could be hired instead of men. And women and children could be paid even less than the men. And often, when families found themselves arriving into these towns, the men didn't get work. The women and children did. And you could be paid whatever the owner chose. Now, if you didn't like what you were being offered, that's OK. Move on. There were plenty of other people that could be hired. There were plenty of people, actually, who were starving and desperate for those jobs. So you took that job even if the pay was minuscule and barely enough for you to live it on. Of course, as thousands of people moved into these new factory towns, they needed housing. Ramshackle buildings, shanty towns really, tenement housing, were built as quickly and as cheaply as possible. But who, of course, owned those shanty towns, those tenement buildings? 
Well, the people who had the money to build them, the owners of the factory. And actually, they could charge whatever they liked. In fact, sometimes these broken down old shanty towns and tenements rented for such high prices that two and three families had to get together in order to afford their rent. In 1845, in Manchester alone, for instance, over 27 cases were documented by um, social workers of up to seven people sharing one bed, just so you could make your rent. And of course, when you went to work, there was no eight-hour working day. You were asked to work 10, 12, 14 hours a day, and you had, couldn't object. There was no 15-minute coffee breaks. There was no lunch hour. Breaks were as short as possible. They were just long enough to keep you healthy enough so that you could keep on working. And of course, there were no health and safety conditions in these factories. There were no regulations. And therefore, these jobs were incredibly dangerous, going down into the coal mines or working the machines. But if you got hurt, if you lost an arm or a leg or your life, there was plenty new labor to supply the factory owner with what they needed, to, to supply the owner of the coal mine with what they needed. And so one would work 10, 12 hours a day in a factory or down a coal mine. And of course, there was no five-day work week. It was a six-day work week. And after that, six-day work week of 10 to 12 hours a day. What was one to do? What was going to happen in one's check? Well, when you got that check, there were a few dollars and a notice of debt of how much you owed. Because, of course, you owed for rent. And in addition to this, you owed for food. You see, people who had four generations produced their own food now had to go to the grocery store to buy food. And who owned the store? That's right, you guessed it, the factory owner. And what could the factory owner charge for that produce? Yes, you guessed it again, whatever he liked. You see, you had no choice but to go to the factory owner's store because at least there you could sign for your food. If you didn't have any money, you were desperate to feed your children, and so they would accept your signature. So by the end of the week, after you're working and working and working and working, you got a paycheck with a few dollars in the amount of how much you owed for food and how much you owed for rent, and now you were in debt. And debt in the 19th century was terrifying, because if you couldn't meet your debts, you would end up in debtor's prison. Sometimes entire families were thrown in debtor's prison, and they would remain there until someone paid that debt. And so there was very little chance that you were not going to show up to work on Monday. And of course, in conditions of desperate poverty, in these shanty towns and tenements, what is attracted there? Bars and brothels. Because what is one going to do with one's few dollars but get mind-numbingly drunk before returning to work on Monday, where the work is repetitive? and menial, and sometimes degrading. Now, there had always been alcoholism, but now it became a massive epidemic of alcoholism. And of course, what happens in those conditions? Domestic violence. Again, domestic violence had al always been known, but now massive occurrences of domestic violence disputes. What we now have is something the world had not seen before or anything like it. We now saw massive urban poverty. Because, of course, these shanty towns as well were not built any more than the factories were with health considerations. Overcrowding, poverty, disease, and death. Now, this suffering is not the suffering of those who are unwilling to work. This is not the suffering of those who are unwilling to do everything they can to advance themselves. This is an enormous suffering of people who are working harder and longer than anyone had ever worked before. And they had very little to no chance to improve their condition. Because when those 
or workers tried to organize for better conditions, when they tried to organize to stop the use of child labor, or for health and safety, or for a better wage, or for shorter working hours, or for the five-day work week, when they tried to organize, what happened? Well, at best, those who tried to organize were fired. At worst, they quietly disappeared and their dead bodies were found as a sign to everyone not long afterwards. Now, these conditions lasted well into the 20th century. And by the time of the 20th century, when workers were managing to strike, which actually they were doing by the end of the 19th century as well, when workers did manage to walk out to strike, to demand better conditions, sometimes hired agents fired into those crowds or burned their camps, killing men, women, and children. You see, it wasn't really until the growth and strength of the labor unions and the workers were able to negotiate for better wages, for better conditions, that these conditions really changed. And that didn't happen to any great extent in America until as late as the 1930s. You see, my, my grandfather worked in the coal mines. As a matter of fact, my grandfather went into the coal mines at seven years old. He worked in the coal mines until he was 13 years old, and then he was out for a year. See, my ancestors are Irish immigrants who came to this country. And so they had no choice but to look for the work they could get, and they had no choice but to send their children to work. And so he was a breaker boy, which meant he had to climb the slag heaps, the coal heaps, and try to pick out the rocks from the coal. And it was an extremely dangerous job because the coal chute would open and the new coal would come down. And if you weren't fast, if you weren't quick, you'd get hurt. He got out for one year when he was 13 years old. When my grandfather was 13, the child labor laws were passed. But then he was back in the coal mine at 14. And he was dead by the age of 35, having spent most of his life in the darkness. My grandmother at the time, my, it was the middle of the Depression when my grandfather died, and my grandmother was left with seven children to raise in the middle of the Depression. Now, my grandmother had a fourth grade education. But at the age of 11 or 12, she went into the factories. She worked at the Scranton Lace Factory, and her job was to catch the thread off a spool as it came off one machine and put it around the spool of another machine at 11 or 12 years old. And she said, a lot of girls lost fingers, you know. But then she was in her 30s with seven children. It was the middle of the Depression. What was one to do? You have to realize there was no recourse then to welfare, to Social Security. There were no protections. There were no guarantees. There was no unemployment insurance. There were no social services. She was left with seven children to raise and nowhere to turn for help. And so my grandmother actually scrubbed the courthouse floors. I used to poetically like to say that she scrubbed the floors of laws that left her out, because that's indeed what the laws were doing at that time. And so at night, she scrubbed the courthouse floors, and in the day, she raised seven children. My grandmother moved in, my great-grandmother. And she did the hotel's laundry. I think it was like a dollar a sheet. She would wash the laundry for the hotel. But you must remember, of course, there were no washing machines. When I say she washed the sheets of the hotel, she washed them on a washer board and then ironed them. And the hotel would pay her for piles of sheets. And my grandmother did raise seven children that way. As a matter of fact, not only did she scrub the courthouse floors and raise seven children, she ran for office. She ran for office with her fourth grade education and her washerwoman background, and she won and became a Democratic committee woman and then a Democratic organizer for the state of Pennsylvania under the New Deal. Those are some of the shoulders that I stand on. And no one ever turned to me and said, are you going to college? No one ever turned to any of my grandmother's 23 grandchildren and said, are you going to college? All that I ever heard is, where are you going to college? Because the thing my grandmother was determined was that we would all have a college education. And of those 23 grandchildren, I think all but two 
have a university education, and a lot of them have an advanced degree. Because my grandmother was determined that we would not be in that situation. And my grandmother taught us all to fight for the rights of the suffering and the oppressed, for those who cannot fight for themselves. And some of those ideas rose out of the reform movements of the 19th century that were responding to the suffering of millions that had been caused by the Industrial Revolution. Because if the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason had not provided for the conditions of human flourishing, what they had done is reveal and put a stark light on human suffering, on injustice. Because, of course, we're talking about the conditions of industrial workers, but there were many who had far worse than the industrial workers did. In 19th century, slavery was legal in the United States and in Europe, the beginning of the 19th century. In 1850, the U.S. Census Bureau says there is 3,200,000 slaves in America. And, of course, they had it far worse than the industrial, revol the industrial worker did. Incredibly degrading, dehumanizing conditions. This, too, received a spotlight during the 19th century. In fact, whereas the 17th century and the 18th century are the ages of reason and enlightenment, the 19th century is the age of reform. Because reason did, if nothing else, point out injustice and suffering of the industrial worker, of the slave, and other injustices came to light. It became apparent to many that it was grossly unjust that women were reduced to little less than property, little more than property. In the 19th century, women had no right to education, they had no right to property, they had no right to inheritance, they had no right to their own children. In fact, if you were divorced in the United States in the 19th century, the children remained with your husband because they were considered his children. That is where that phrase, I'm bearing his child, come from. Be careful when you use it because it denies women all right to their own children. And that was legally enacted in court. As these injustices came to light, massive reform movements were created to protest and change these conditions. The women's rights movement, the abolition, the movement for the abolition of slavery, the movement to end child labor, workers' rights movements, actually even the temperance movement, which worked to get alcohol made illegal and actually was successful before any of the other movements were. It was out of a need to create a moral theory that would support these reform movements, that would inspire human beings to participate and actively work to alleviate the suffering of others that our next moral theory was developed. Because you see, not everyone was so enthusiastic about alleviating the suffering of others. Not everyone was so enthusiastic about giving women's rights or ending child labor or helping the suffering worker. There were many who were quite content with those conditions, especially those who were gaining money and power from that very plight. Some of these factory owners, politicians and rulers, found a justification in not helping suffering others in the work of an Anglican minister called Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus lived from 1766 to 1834. Thomas Malthus actually noted what many people have since, and that is that food production grows arithmetically. One, two, three, four, whereas population increases geometrically. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Therefore, Malthus noted that population will eventually outgrow the food supply. 
which will lead to desperate conditions for everyone. Malthus, Malthus went further and actually said that, well, we all know the poor have more children than the rich. Therefore, if we help the poor, well, that will just encourage them to marry younger and have more children. If we help the poor, we will contribute to this population explosion, and population will outgrow the food supply, and we will all be in desperate trouble. Therefore, we should not help the poor. Let's look at this argument. These are called Malthusian principles. If we help the poor, they will have more children. Population will outgrow the food supply, and this will lead to disaster. So the conclusion of the argument is, do not help the poor. Now these Malthusian principles were adopted by many of the rich and powerful. Furthermore, they were supported by another ethic, the Protestant work ethic. The Protestant work ethic had really arisen out of Reformation ideas. And according to the Protestant work ethic, hard work and virtue are rewarded by God with prosperity. Therefore, if one is poor, well, one must not work hard, or one must fail to be virtuous. Therefore, the conditions of the poor can be blamed on who? Of course, the poor themselves. Well, there was one gentleman in particular who was particularly interested in refuting these Malthusian principles and in refuting the Protestant work ethic and inspiring people to work to alleviate the suffering of others. And that gentleman is the founder of our next moral theory, his name is Jeremy Bentham. He lived from 1748 to 1832. Now, Jeremy Bentham was extremely concerned with the fact that most moral theories did not impel people to help one another. At first, Bentham was really interested in providing a reasoning which supported a reformation of the legal system in Britain. If you remember any of our, know any of the novels of Charles Dickens, he sometimes captures the realities of the British legal system of the 19th century. Now, the British legal system advantaged the rich and horribly disadvantaged the poor. And Bentham, as a lawyer, was, ex was interested in arguing for reform of that system. And so he began to create his theory for that purpose. He ended by creating a moral theory that has had such enormous influence that most of us use it almost automatically. Utilitarianism, the name of his theory, is actually the number one secular humanist moral theory. In other words, secular meaning non-religious, humanistic meaning concerned with the advancement of humanity. So this number one secular humanist moral theory is utilitarianism developed by Jeremy Bentham. Bentham pointed out that most moral theories concentrated on preventing harm, but put very little emphasis on promoting the good. Let's look at this, natural law theory. Natural law theory according to Thomas Aquinas, really concentrates on not violating the four fundamental values. But it puts very little emphasis on promoting the fundamental values. Greek rational ethics, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they were concerned with not harming others. They were concerned with acting justly. But they provided no motivation to help others who were suffering. Kantian ethics. Kant's ethics are very good at telling you what you should not do, but provides very little motivation for what you should do, for doing the good. In fact, of all of the theories that we've looked at so far, the only theories that really say that you need to help the suffering stranger are Judeo-Christian ethics. But it had become apparent to Bentham that this was not what was being done in reality. 
In fact, most Christians, he pointed out in the 19th century, were far more concerned with the thou shalt nots of the Bible than with helping suffering strangers. A matter of fact, most limited their charity to lining the church coffers and lining the church coffers only because they thought it would increase their own prosperity if they did so. So the Judeo-Christian ethic of helping suffering strangers seemed to have been left far behind. And Bentham was quick to point out the hypocrisy of many Christians. So Bentham was extremely interested in providing a moral theory that demanded that people help others who are suffering. And he wanted to provide a rational basis for that motivation that was not based on any particular church. Bentham believed that the the church actually undermined efforts at reform because the church preached that one should sacrifice oneself, that one should be humble, that one should suffer in silence. And Bentham pointed out that these Preachings, though rarely practiced by the powerful within the church, undermined people's own efforts to reform the conditions under which they lived. Furthermore, he pointed out the hypocrisy of many of the Christian churches, and he recognized the difficulty with any divine command theory, as we've discussed again and again. As a matter of fact, Bentham helped found London University. He founded London University in order to provide an education to those who could not get into Oxford and Cambridge simply because they did not profess to be members of the Anglican Church. You see, in the 19th century, if you were not a member of the Church of England, you could not study at Oxford or Cambridge. And so Bentham founded London University with others to do that. Now, in order to create this new moral theory, Bentham used the principle of utility. Now the word utility was actually first used by David Hume. You will remember David Hume is the philosopher who made Kant so angry by suggesting that morality was a matter of sentiment. Well David Hume also proposed that if an action provides happiness to oneself and to others, that action has utility or benefit. Hume did not develop this idea of utility into a full moral theory. Bentham, in fact, did. He based his theory, as I said, on the principle of utility, which is often called the greatest happiness principle, which is the idea that the moral action should bring the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. Now let's look at the reasoning behind this theory. The reasoning behind utilitarianism, based on the principle of utility, is simple hedonism. Hedonism is the idea that people pursue pleasure and avoid pain. That's an observation. Certainly, without any prompting, people naturally pursue pleasure and people naturally avoid pain. Therefore, hedonism puts forward the simple observation, people pursue pleasure and avoid pain. Therefore, what is good? Pleasure is good. What is pain? What is bad? Excuse me. Pain is bad. Well, ethical hedonists take this a step further. They say if people naturally pursue pleasure and avoid pain, then pleasure and pain must define what is good and bad for human beings. What is morally right and morally wrong? What is morally right? Pleasure. What is morally wrong? Pain. Therefore, ethical hedonism suggests that people ought to pursue pleasure and avoid pain. From these simple developments, we get the principle of utility. The principle of utility always act to promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Therefore, if any action you take promotes the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people affected by that act, it is a moral act. You see, this is consequentialist. You look to the presumed consequences or the consequences of an action, and if that action brought the greatest amount of happiness possible to the greatest number of people, that is the moral act. And from this simple base of hedonistic reasoning, 
arises the definition of the good in utilitarianism and the justification for the good in utilitarianism. Let's look at that, the definition of the good in utilitarianism. The greatest pleasure and the least pain for the greatest number. So, utilitarianism demands that we act not just to bring ourselves pleasure, that we not just be concerned about our own pain, nor are we to be only concerned about the pleasure and happiness of our family and loved ones. We are to be concerned about what brings the greatest pleasure and the least pain to the greatest number of people. Now Bentham recognized that in order to motivate people to be concerned about more than just their own pleasure and pain or more than just their own family's pleasure and pain, he had to formulate an egoistic hook. He had to show people that it was in their self-interest to alleviate the suffering of others. He wanted to show people that it was in their self-interest to motivate people to work for the flourishing of all human beings. And so he developed a justification for his morality that would do that. And next episode, we will look at Bentham's justification for utilitarian philosophy, and then we will look at the method that arises out of that philosophy and begin to apply it to moral dilemmas and ethical controversies. So until next time, take care, read your chapters, have a good day.